Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator so that I, I would use welcome to another session here with uh, dr anna sasaki is all the way from greece uh, she's a highly skilled prosthodontist with a wealth of experience in the field of dentistry. She graduated with a DDS and MS, and she completed a residency in advanced education in prosthodontics at the University of Alabama <laughs> at Birmingham, where she was recognized as the chief resident. Uh, during her residency program, Dr. Anastasia gained uh, extensive clinical experience in various aspects of prosthodontics, including fixed, removable, and digital dentistry, as well as implantology and orofacial pain uh, management. She holds a master's degree in dentistry, focusing on implant prosthodontics. Uh, prior to her residency, uh, Alcaterini uh, earned a DES from the National Capodestrian University in Athens, uh, in University of School of Dentistry in Greece, where she demonstrated exceptional academic achievement. Uh, her dedication to excellence was prevalent with a consistent top ranking performances, earning a honorary prize from the Greece, Greek uh, Ministry of Education. Dr. Anasasakis, is a pleasure, a great pleasure to have you on Dental Webinar Series today. Thank you once again. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very honored to be part of this great study group. Um, thank you again. And you've been so kind and your words, you know, I'm very honored by them. I, I wish I can, you know, um, live up to all these. Uh, you will. I, you all right. Um, so once again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, we'll, I feel very honored. Um, I'm a young Prosthodontist. I'm a young graduate, and this is, you know, I'm only starting now to just give out some lectures and be part of study groups. So I'm very excited for today. Uh, thank you. Um, we are going to talk about uh, restoring the worn dentition. Um, this is a huge chapter, and anybody, everybody knows that. Um, there are different aspects, and um, it's quite a it's quite a chapter. So I'm only going to focus on some parts, and then we can have a nice discussion about it. Um, again, thank you for the introduction. So I'm going to only you know um, very quickly go through some things about me. Um, for those who didn't listen to that, I was born and raised in Athens, Greece, and then I became uh, a dentist in 2017. I graduated then from the University of Athens. And then I decided to I decided to um, continue my education in the U.S. and do a prosthodontics residency. I was very fortunate to be accepted in the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, this is one of the top uh, universities in the U.S. Um, I had uh, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of patients, a lot of cases. Um, so I was exposed to all different kinds and things in prosthodontics. Um, um, there is a huge uh, dental um, lab alongside the prosthodontic uh, residency. So I was exposed to the CAD CAM technologies and overall it was a, um, a very nice experience. And after that, I decided to return to my home country, Greece. And I've been practicing here in private practice, and I've been trying to help the Greek people with what I've learned. Um, and overall, I'm very happy. I'm practicing what I was uh, taught, and, you know, life goes on for me here now. Um, today, again, we're going to talk about toothwear. I think it's a phenomenon that almost all um, practicing dentists face every day. Um, some are aware of it and some know the reasons and the consequences of it. Some of them just see it, you know, and they don't really know what's hidden behind it. Um, 
let's talk about all the different types of wear. Uh, not all wear is the same. Um, first of all, uh, let's just say that wear is a natural phenomenon, right? We all know that um, as we're getting old, we do lose some of the tooth structure and that's normal. Um, it's a universal consequence of aging. Um, uh, there will be change to the tooth surfaces. Um, most commonly, we will see that changes on the incisal edges of the maxillary and mandibular incisors. We all know that as we're getting older, uh, we do uh, so uh, less teeth, but we do uh, see that as a natural phenomenon. Um, again, it's only natural when it happens to, you know, uh, when it happens progressively as we, as we age. Um, what we call um, pathological wear uh, is when we see unacceptable levels of wear that do need our uh, treatment, that do that we do need to do something, and that usually they're not uh, at the same, you know, they're not expected to be there um, taking in consideration the patient's age. Um, all the pictures that I'm showing is from my patient, is from my one of my patients in residency. Um, you can see that this um, particular patient that I chose to show has all different types of tooth wear. And let's talk about a little bit about these. So again, pathological wear is where wear becomes unacceptable. Um, and it can be categorized in some uh, in four or more uh, categories. So I think you, you all heard of attrition. Attrition is when we, uh, we do see the loss of enamel or, or the dentin, and it's usually uh, due to the tooth to tooth uh, contact. Um, so this is actual and mechanical wear that's uh, coming from actual mastication or comes from parafunction. It's uh, very evident to the people who are braxers, let's just say. Um, a common uh, test that we can do to actually recognize attrition is to ask the patient to bring their teeth together. And when we do see that the upper and the lower teeth, they just fit like a, a two pieces of a puzzle, we know that uh, this is the attrition uh, type of wear due to bruxism. Uh, then uh, we all know about erosion. I'm so sorry, just a second. Uh, we've all heard about erosion. Uh, erosion is the loss of dental hard tissues. Again, the loss of enamel or of dentin, and it's usually caused by a chemical action, uh, by a chemical agent uh, that has nothing to do with bacteria. Uh, erosion can be categorized in two um, categories. It's either extrinsic, uh, that's um, usually when um, our patients, um, they are consuming acids in dietary components. Let's just, let's just say they're, they're, they, do use, uh, they do drink a lot of sodas, a lot of fruit juice, they like to chew on lemons and oranges. And then there is intrinsic erosion, which is actually due to the acids that originate in the stomach and that are associated with eating disorders like anorexia, bulimia. Um, actually, um, the literature um, has showed that um, especially young females that come to our practice and that we do see a lot of erosion uh, signs uh, can be can be victims of these uh, mental disorders such as anorexia or bulimia and that as and that as as dentists uh, we can be the first ones to address that issue just a second sorry I have a dog, I'm so sorry. Um, then we need to consider to ask questions about their diet, uh, about whether they're, they have visited their general practitioner, talk about GERD. We can be the first ones to, you know, alert on these uh, symptoms. Um, and then we have abrasion. Again, abrasion is very common. Uh, it's It used to be called tooth brush abrasion. 
uh, because it's usually uh, when our patients um, brush hard and this is why we see the lesions uh, more frequently uh, on the side of the mouth of the opposite hand, because let's say uh, if I'm brushing with my right hand, um, I am putting a lot of force uh, when I am brushing on my left side. It's easier for me to reach there. Um, again, this is something that we should uh, alert uh, the patient when we see that. Uh, we can uh, prevent it or um, uh, we can prevent it and we can make the patient alert of this, you know, actual uh, bad, bad habit. Um, what's interesting about dental wear and what's, what we should always keep in mind, and that's very important for me, and that's something that um, I'm trying to communicate to all uh, other dentists, is that usually no, um, no category comes along. For example, if you do see uh, patients that have wear, uh, usually they have more than one type. For example, uh, when we see uh, people with erosion, then because of because their um, hard and soft tissues have become vulnerable, usually they are more prone to other types of wear. So in mo in most mouths that you are going to examine, you should you will see both erosion and attrition or both abrasion and erosion. So it's a combination. Um, okay, just for erosion, a nice tip uh, when you actually see that uh, erosion is happening is that you can educate your patient to delay one hour uh, brushing their teeth after um, an acid has come in, in their mouth and that uh, will increase the resistance of tooth surface to abrasion. Um, again, uh, one last type is uh, abfraction, and that's uh, usually uh, um, an actual. The actual definition is the pathological loss of tooth substance caused by biomechanical loading forces that result in flexure and failure of enamel and dentin at the location away from the loading. For example, let's just say that somebody's a braxer, right? Um, they do load the tooth vertically. However, you will see a fraction on the neck of the tooth. And that's just uh, how physics work. Um, usually they are single tooth lesions with unaffected teeth on the other side. Um, they are lesions at the cervical region. Uh, they are wedge shaped. They're sharp. Um, they have sharp internal, internal and external line angles. Um, the etiology is that the tooth, um, there's a tooth flexure from tensile stresses led that led to cervical tooth uh, breakdown. Um, actually, uh, the literature cannot say why these uh, lesions only occur on the buccal and not on the lingual, lingual areas of the teeth. Um, again, uh, we do think that it's mostly um, due to malocclusion, parafunctional habits, and TMJ disorders. So these were the actual categories of wear. And let's just say that we are all educated in how to recognize them by knowing the definition of them. However, the patient does not care if he has a fraction or if he has erosion if he, or if he has attrition. What he does care about is that overall no. during the years, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, overall, during the years, uh, this has most probably led to some aesthetic concerns. For example, he one day he woke up and he noticed that oh my teeth used to be uh, used to be longer. I, I now have short teeth. Usually, what happens is that these people, because the wear does not happen overnight, because the wear is progressive, um, they do not recognize uh, the problem immediately. So most of the times, like they wake up one day and they and they they see their teeth in the mirror and they think that oh my teeth you know uh, used to be longer. So they do have they do um they do have some aesthetic concerns. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, over time they do develop functional issues, right? Uh, because the teeth 
uh, are losing tooth structure, they become flat. So that means that they are having some chewing difficulties. Um, because the teeth are um, losing tooth structure, uh, the teeth become sensitive. So this does mean that the patient um, develops sensitivity. Um, apart from that, of course, uh, if we're talking about erosion, let's say, and uh, because we mentioned all, all that as a diet, uh, these patients do have some long-term dental health consequences. Um, and apart from that, um, if we're not just focused on the teeth and if we are to focus on the whole face, losing tooth structure, of course, in some cases, not all of the cases, losing, some, uh, losing tooth structure does lead to the loss of vertical dimension of occlusion. Uh, which then has a result and has a consequence in the overall face height. And of course, uh, dentally, uh, most of these patients have, uh, have lost uh, prosthetic space, which is a problem later if we're going to go and restore and do something about it. I'm just showing you some photographs, which um, I'm, pointing, I'm pointing out what I mentioned before, that most of the times you do not see just one type of wear, uh, you do see a combination of wear. For example, again, this is my patient from residency. Uh, this is like, um, first thing that comes in mind is erosion, right? Um, you can see all this acid, um, acid erosion on the buckle. And usually when you see acid erosion on the buckle, that means that uh, the etiology is, is extrinsic. That means that the patient has a habit of putting something of you know taking something in that um breaks the facial aspect of the tooth usually it's a soda or some people like to chew on lemons and same with the buccal aspects of the teeth but you also see that this patient has attrition that uh, sees a fracture so you do see that her teeth are also flat on top and also you do see the cup um cup shaped v shaped lesions of a bra of up of up fraction because again C is a fracture so it's a combination of syndromes um this patient has not lost her vertical dimension of occlusion because she does have some crowns and the crowns kept the vertical dimension of occlusion as it was before uh they were again um now you do, as a dentist, develop some questions when this patient comes in and you diagnose the wear, um, you have some questions in mind, and especially if it's not something that you are doing every day, right? Uh, and these were my questions where when I started to, you know, restore these patients in residency. Um, does this patient need a full mouth rehabilitation? Uh, the answer is, it depends on how, you know, uh, on how large is the wear, how many teeth uh, need to be, you know, need to be restored. Uh, and then when, where do you, when, where do you restore this patient? Uh, are you going to restore this pa patient in MICP or are you going to alter the vertical dimension of occlusion and you are going to work this case in centric relation? And then if you're not very familiar with this concept, why is CR so difficult to find? And then let's say you decide that this is a full mouth rehabilitation case. Uh, where do you start? Do you start with the upper? Do you start with the lower teeth? And overall, how do you work up such a complicated treatment plan? And again, how do you provision provisionalize and restore a case? So in this case, these cases, like uh, us prosthodontists, like to flex about these cases, but they're not, uh, they are not so glamorous or so difficult. Um, again, you and I think that, and I hope that everybody has this mindset. Uh, this is a service to your patient. It's not about you, you know, um, making it for the money or making it for the photographs. Um, in dentistry and in prosthodontics, we say that you cannot, you are never paid enough for a full mouth rehabilitation. It's always going to be, you know, you cannot put a price on the actual amount of time and effort that you're going to put uh, to restore that case. Um, 
Exactly. And that's what I'm saying here, that you cannot charge enough to justify the actual number of appointments and time that it takes to do it correctly. Um, especially if you're in a very busy private practice um, and, you know, or for some reason the patient cannot be seen very cannot be seen regularly, this is going to take a lot of time. Um, one thing that you should be very careful about is patient selection. It's something that I learned to do in residency. Uh, you have to psychoanalyze your patient first. Um, you have to be very clear in explaining the process to the patient and you have to be very clear in um, managing expectation to the patient. Uh, not everybody can uh, withstand uh, or has the patient to go through a full mouth rehabilitation. And, and that's something that you can, you have to be able to see before you start treatment. Um, it's a, it's a dynamic process. Every, every case is not the same and you learn a lot about what not to do um in the next case and how to you know prevent errors and mistakes uh and of course uh, all of that being being said it's extremely rewarding when you finish a case like that um again these are some you know general ideas but these are very um very important um not it's very difficult to most of the times it's very difficult to explain to the patient their needs so uh, for example the patient that i'm showing you she did came into the practice with you know wanting to just restore her four central incisors i what i'm saying is that most patients they will show up in your chair and they will have no idea how bad their, their dentition is and how much work they need and that's not only a psychological burden to accept that instead instead of just doing four teeth i need to do my whole mouth but immediately it raises the the budget so you should give your patient time uh, to accept um what he needs and time to think about it and make a you know make a very um cognitive uh, decision to come to you and start the treatment. Um, and again, how the patient responds to the news uh, that you do need to, we do need to change your whole, um, a lot of your teeth, not just the ones that you think they have a problem. Uh, they will tell you a lot about whether they are not a good candidate or whether they are like, uh, if they have the I only fi fix things when they break mindset, uh, we are you are most probably wasting your time, and the, the, this is not a good candidate for such a huge treatment. Uh, again, so yes, tooth wear patients are patients that can benefit from a full mouth rehabilitation. Uh, we mentioned that uh, the wear the wear can be from bruxism, erosion, uh, and abrasion. Some facts is that uh, the prevalence of such wear is between 3 and 17 percent, uh, and that's an increasing problem in all age groups. Um, okay, and then I mentioned about the vertical dimension of occlusion, and I'm a prosthodontist, so of course I'm going to mention about the vertical dimension of occlusion. Uh, before you start um, managing such a case, you need to decide whether you should alter the vertical dimension of occlusion or not. I'm just taking for granted that everybody knows what's the vertical dimension of occlusion. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, uh, the facial height and uh, when the patient uh, has beaten down. Um, so that's a, that's the biggest question. That's the first biggest question, uh, if you're going to alter it or not. Um, most of the times, um, it's easy to say, let's go and raise the vertical dimension of occlusion uh, when we see wear, but it does not mean necessarily that the patient has lost the vertical dimension of occlusion. Some of, sometimes we are just doing it to uh, gain some restorative space. However, uh, there are some tests to actually see if the patient has lost the vertical dimension of occlusion. Uh, one of the here are some some of the of the tests that I like to use to actually whether I'm I'm going to alter it alter it or not, just to know if the patient has lost vertical dimension of occlusion or not. 
First of all, I use the closest speaking space, uh, which means that I have the patient say words with a sibilant sound, um, let's just say with S. So let's say I have the patient say Mississippi and seashore. And then I do look, look at the closest space between the incisors. Uh, the more space you see with these sounds, the more you can open them up if you need to. Um, if it's a large space, if the teeth they're not if the teeth are not coming together, uh, that means that sometimes it affects the patient's speech. Um, then I then I like to um, watch the freeway space, uh, and that's more like we're doing in the dentures. Um, uh, typically, we do ones uh, uh, around two to three millimeters. It's exactly like we're doing with dentures, uh, but we can have more the older the patient is. Um, but just because a patient doesn't have more than two millimeters of space doesn't always mean uh, you can't open them up if you really need to. And then, of course, uh, we do need to look at the restorative space. Uh, and that's the most common, as I was saying, that that's the most common justification to open the vertical dimension of occlusion if a dentition is worn down. Um, if the patient decides that they want their mouth rehabilitated, we do need to find some space. And then that means that we do have to open the vertical dimension. Um, that's a great tool to open the vertical dimension just because that helps a lot with leveling the uneven occlusal planes. Um, of course, you cannot just do it, you know, you, you need to be in, in, a, in a specific range. And that's a nice article that talks about um, the, co the consequences, how much we can open and things like that. Um, it's the safety of increasing vertical dimension of occlusion. It's a systematic review by Jafar Abduo. So it investigated the actual implications of increasing the vertical dimension of occlusion. Uh, four variables were identified to be relevant to the topic, uh, and that was magnitude of video increase, how much, uh, the method of increasing vertical dimension, uh, fixed or removable, the occlusal scheme, and the adaptation period. So the, the author, and after the review, um, the article generally suggested that a freeway space greater than two millimeters indicates that the patient has room to be opened up after the measurements, like we're doing with complete dentures. Um, however, several of the studies in the review opened patients beyond this physiologic space without complications. So from the nine studies included in this review, the general cons consensus is that most patients can have their vertical opened five millimeters without complications, and the patient can adapt to that change. Uh, but this must be evaluated on a patient-to-patient -patient basis, uh, though it's not a panacea, because altering the vertical dimension of occlusion has effects on many other aspects of the patient's aesthetics and function. It's not only about teeth. Um, how long should we wait after uh, the video change and before placing the definitive restorations? Uh, that's a very good question that I've been asked a lot. Um, and the article says that since the majority of the studies reported resolution of signs and symptoms from the TMJ within one to two weeks, it is wise to consider a probationary period of a few weeks before the placement of complex definite restorations. Throughout this period, the patient can be thoroughly reviewed and the restoration adjusted accordingly. Of course, he was talking about uh, some fixed provisionals. Here again, uh, should we use fixed or removable? Um, in general, uh, the significant splint limitations, because when we're talking about removable ver uh, vertical dimension change, we, we actually are meant, we are talking about the splint, right? So in general, the significant splint limitations are patient discomfort, interference with speech, and the lack of aesthetic assessment. So nevertheless, the splint should still be considered when the patient presents with TMD signs and symptoms before embarking on definitive rehabilitation. In relation to the fixed method, which is most common, the temporaries, all the studies reported consistent and predictable patient adaptation. 
And that's because the patient is wearing the temporaries 24 seven. Uh, where the restorations are tooth supported, the most commonly reported symptoms are the subjective grinding and clenching, which has the tendency to resolve within one to two weeks. And then for implant supported prosthesis, an extended adaptation period, two to three mon months was reported. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, the question becomes uh, about the, uh, I'm so sorry, I cannot see. Uh, the question becomes what occlusion relationship is uh, best for opening uh, the patient's vertical dimension of occlusion. And I did mention about CR. Of course, we are prosthodontists. Our favorite uh, jaw position, jaw position, not teeth position, is centric relation. And again, uh, the article verifies that, that centric relation is recommended as a restorative position of the condyles due to its reproducibility and patient comfort. Um, and of course, we cannot talk about uh, an MIP uh, when the teeth are prepared, right? Um, in general, for the mutually protected occlusion and group function, which are the schemes that we do uh, love in prosthodontics, uh, studies uh, revealed the possibility of uh, safe application of both uh, schemes if the patient is restored in centric relation. Um, despite the limited evidence, uh, bilaterally ban balanced occlusion um, was discouraged because of the possible risk of inducing parafunctional activities. In prosthodontics, again, we don't like all of the teeth to participate in centric and, and centric movements. And they included studies in this review that applied the bilaterally balanced occlusion reported greater incidence, greater incidence of uh, subjective symptoms. Now, uh, again, a little uh, some things about centric relation because I think that the you know um, we fought a lot. At me as a resident, I fought a lot about the scheme and understanding this concept. Right, um, that's mostly because like it's rarely explained in dental school. We just learn the definition and we stop there. Um, most of the fixed cases are conformative. So you're just trying to fix a tooth and you stop there. But in these cases of full wear, when you're, you know, you're actually doing a full mouth rehabilitation, uh, you need to know why, why you're working in CR. And the reason is one, it is, is because as we mentioned before, it's not a teeth position. It's not about how the teeth are coming together. It's because it's a jaw position, it's a physiologic jaw position. And that means that it's repeatable. It's the only position that no matter what I do to the teeth, if I prep them, if I prep the second molars, if, I, if they are not coming together or if they are coming together, it's the only uh, actual jaw position that I can reproduce again and again. And that's the most important thing to keep in mind about CR. And this is why we choose to work in this position. All right. Um, so then the question becomes, uh, after I have decided that I'm going to do a full mouth rehab on this um, where patients and after I've decided that I'm going to work in centric relation, uh, then the question becomes, okay, how do I start? Um, how do I start working that uh, that case? Um, again, we bring in mind the the complete dentures. Complete dentures are a kind of fixed full mouth rehabilitations that we can always, you know, refer to and take a lot of uh, key points from there. Um, for example. Well, when you're doing a complete complete denture, uh, as you're doing the work streams, what are you? Um, what are the things that you are establishing? Right, you are establishing your incisal edge position and your canines. So this is how you are actually going to start in a full mouth rehabilitation as well. Uh, for full mouth rehabs, you ideally want to establish canine guidance, but if the patient has a very horizontal chewing pattern with flat teeth, you should consider group function and uh, flatter casps. And just a second. Um, all right. Uh, of course, um, 
in pros, uh, that means that before starting, you have done all of the other, you know, restorative and paleo work. Um, you've done your paleo charting. You have done your tooth by tooth heart tissue charting. Uh, you have good diagnostic casts. You have good intraoral photos. Uh, you have analyzed the occlusal plane. Um, you have determined what needs to be longer or shorter. You have determined your vertical dimension, if you need to open it up or not. Again, you have taken a good CR record. So this is the things. This is another uh, worn dentition patient. And where do you start? As we said before, you, you're going to analyze uh, the occlusal plane. Uh, you do see here that uh, it has become irregular over time. However, you're always going to have some guidance. Uh, in this uh, patient, your guidance is going to be the lower canine, right? Because it's the tooth that is less worn down. So you'll take your diagnostic casts and then you'll start with a wax up and you will order to your dental technician to follow that cane and to establish a better occlusal plane, upper and lower. How do you take your CR record? You are going to use uh, whatever method fits better for you. So there are various methods of taking an actual CR record. Um, taking a CR record means actually guiding the lower jaw to centric relation. Um, some people are very easy um, um, to guide to CR. You can actually understand by feeling their condos that their lower jaw is going back to centric relation. They do, they do not have any muscle con contraction. Other people are more difficult to be guided into centric relation. In these kind of patients, you do need to have an anterior deprogrammer. I hope that you've all uh, heard um, that um, definition, right? An anterior deprogrammer, it's actually um, a device that we use. Um, in the uh, front teeth, in the incisors. And actually, in simple words, it helps us with, you know, deprogramming the muscles uh, in patients that have a muscle co-contraction. Um, because uh, the deprogrammer does not allow the back teeth to come in contact, that means that our muscles, again, they're not, they're not contracting. So, they are relaxing and they will allow the lower jaw, the mandible to come into CR. All you need to do is have a lift cage or create the lucid jig that fits to your um, um, to your patient central incisors. It has to be um, as slim uh, as possible You'd, because as you're as you're making the as you're testing it, you're not just guiding the patient to CR, but because there is a certain thickness, you're altering the vertical dimension of occlusion as well. So you need to have your um, anterior deprogrammer be as thin as possible. Because yes, you do want to guide your patient to CR, but you don't want to, al to alter the vertical dimension of occlusion too much. Because the more you alter it while taking a CR record, you lose a little bit of accuracy. So this is what we did here in, the, in that case. Uh, you are using the deprogrammer, making sure the patient has uh, come back into centric relation, and then you take a record. Again, I mentioned about that. So why are you taking the record? You are taking the record because you're going to send your um, diagnostic um, casts to the lab, and you are going to ask about for a diagnostic wax up, right? Um, the lab or you, if you're a prosthodontist, they are going to mount the models with a Facebook and the CR record, and they're going to duplicate and cross mount those those models for you for the workshop. Um, again, a full mouth always starts with determining whether uh, where you need to have the incisal edge position and the midline, just like the dentures that I mentioned before. And this is, uh, these are the mounted casts of the previous case in CR. And that's the wax up that you actually ask your technician to do. All right. So you have your uh, casts mounted, the wax up is done, the patient is in the chair, and it's the first time that 
you know, you are going to start on the patient. Before anything else, uh, if where patients are a good case for for a mock-up, you know, we've all heard it. Um, usually we call it a motivational mock-up because they do have um, lost um, tooth structure. You can you can actually go and with, uh, you know, temporary material, a bisacryl, let's say, uh, making a matrix from the wax up, you can do a mock-up and actually, you know, um, it's the first time that you can show them what you're aiming to. Um, I hope you're all familiar with mock-up, uh, with the word mock-up. Um, I think it's a very important step and I'm trying to remember it, to do it more often. Sometimes I actually forget about this step, but it's a very uh, interesting and it's a very important step because that's the, the first time that the patient can actually visualize the end result. And that's not only making the patient happy, but that's also uh, keeping the patient motivated until the end of the treatment. Also, it's a diagnostic tool for you, right? Um, doing the mock-up from the actual walk-up that I showed previously uh, allows you to check the midline, allows you to uh, check the inside of display, at rest, smiling, the occlusal plane, phonetics, making sure that you have not altered the video more than you want, than you want and then you can go and make some chair side um, changes to your mock-up because usually it's a piece acrylic um, material that we use like it's it's a material like like composite resin so you can go with your actual burr and diamond and change what you want to change and that and then take an alginate of that and then send it back to your technician and say your workshop was perfect i tried it in the mouth but i want us to change this and this and this Again, where patients are beautiful patients to do a mock-up because they've lost tooth structure, so it's easy for you to go and add uh, the temporary material. Not all patients can receive a mock-up. Also, some of these where patients, uh, one thing that I want to mention is that after you've done your diagnostic mock-up, um, you have determined proportions, right? Most of the times you need to add some length to the teeth that have been, you know, uh, have been worn down. You can do that by adding to the incisals, but you should always keep in mind that, especially in these patients that are braxers and you, you see some, you know, um, you do see that uh, there is exten extensive extostosis everywhere. You can always lengthen teeth from the other way back, right? You you can always uh, crown lengthen those teeth. And this is what we chose to do in that uh, patient. Again, that's uh, the um, that's the matrix for a mock-up. The mock-up. Now, uh, you've done the mock-up, you've decided you and your patient that we, we like what we see and that, you know, he's on board. It's time for you to start prepping teeth and provisional ways, right? Um, you all know that there, all there are a lot of different ways to do provisionals. You can actually do church side provisionals, or nowadays more and more people are asking for milled PMMA provisionals, right? Uh, no matter how how are you going to work, you need some um, you need some. Or, uh, you need some stops, occlusal stops, so they can hold the new vertical dimension of occlusion so that you know how much to prepare and where to provisionalize, right? Um, I learned that in residency and that was super uh, important and helpful for me. Um, we did, we did uh, use some uh, centric relation position jigs uh, that these were fabricated using the workshops and the diagnostic casts. Let me show you. Um, these are some milk provisionals. And this is how we used to uh, make these jigs so that we know, like I am prepping this side. Okay, I'm going to have the jig on the other side. It's going to hold my desired vertical dimension because if I'm going to open the vertical dimension, I need to prep less than if I was keeping the same vertical dimension, right? Again, the jigs. 
dig on the other side of the, the side that I'm prepping to hold the vertical dimension. And then these were the provisionals realigned. And then you've prepped, you've provisionalized. And these provisionals become your new workshop, right? Uh, all the adjustments that you want to make, make them on the provisionals because this is your test drive now. Um, and then whenever you're uh, sure about the aesthetics, the phonetics and things like that, you make some alginates and, and then you're ready for your, um, for your final impressions. Um, generally, I like to uh, have, um, I, I like to do like, full arts impressions for uh, this where for full mouth patients. I don't like to do partial arts impressions. Um, it's better if you can restore both arches at the same time, uh, but you can always start from one posterior sextant or the anterior and the bite registration is very, very important. So again, I like to, you know, um, take a final impression of a full art, a bite registration only on one side and then on the other side, but never covering the the full arts because the material distorts. You don't want to go like that with your uh, bite registration, never. One side, second side. And these are the provisionals in place of the wear patient. And I think these, yes, these were the finals that were just, you know, copy milled from the provisionals. Now what's new? Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, things that somebody can, you know, go and search after that presentation. Um, what I saw you, what I showed you was just, you know, a wear patient that was treated with a full mouth rehab with crowns. Uh, that was, you know, our approach in residency. But things are changing and evolving every day. Um, what I like to work now more um, is that, you know, partial coverage restorations. Uh, I am becoming more and more fan of um, onlys. Uh, in these patients, I think if I was to go back, I would not have prepped their teeth uh, 360. I would just, you know, have done some... Um, occlusal onlys, uh, because that's a good way to open up the vertical dimension of occlusion and at the same time being conservative. Also, um, because we are having these new hybrid materials, you know, uh, in the market, you can find materials that are half composite and half zirconia now. Uh, I would have tried these, you know, these choices either as uh, onlys or even as temporary crowns. And in this way, I would have kept the cost uh, lower for my patient. So I think that the wear patient is going to benefit a lot uh, from all the new technologies and from all the new evolving materials. And I think I'm going to show you just one last case. Um, uh, again, uh, this is... Uh, the, the patient from the first slides, uh, one of my favorite patients, um, uh, full mouth, uh, wear erosion patient. Uh, you can see the extrinsic um, uh, wear and the attrition. Again, uh, after the walks up, we decided that this patient needs to lengthen their teeth, but we cannot just add to the incisal, right? Because then we would cover the lower teeth completely. We need to add from the neck as well. So we did do um, a crown lengthening procedure on all from premolar to premolar, I think. And that's the result after healing. I love it. Um, that's a right and left side. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, the patient had not lost the vertical dimension of occlusion because it had those crowns, you know, holding it. Uh, but we did need to open the vertical dimension to find restorative space. And that's the final... Um, that's the finals in the front, in the incisals, and that's the full mouth case uh, completed. And uh, thank you very much I, for the presentation. I'm going to stop here so we can have some Q&As.
All right. Thank you so much. If you do have any questions, uh, uh, there's a question there. Mm. I've seen a question in the Q&A. Just let, let's pull it up here. Is that what's the most common type of wear case that you see in, um, I guess he's referring to where you are practicing right now, which is in Greece area. What was most what was the percentage and what do you think uh, are the predisposing factors? Yes, uh, we do see a lot of wear and attrition. Uh, attrition wear. Uh, I think um, um, I do see, I don't know if because I'm a prosthodontist and I know how, you know, and I'm used to seeing these patients, but I do see a lot of attrition from Braxers. Uh, because I think um, a lot of people they're braxing and they don't they don't actually know they're doing it, so mm -hmm. they do have types of wear in their teeth. So I would say attrition, and then second of all, I would say erosion uh, because you know um, dietary disorders are becoming you know more and more uh, usual, especially in young people. So I would say erosion as well. Right. Uh, I know, do you see this case uh, right here? Yes, I do. Okay, so it's a, it's a patient showed up a couple couple weeks back, and I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, we're gonna hold on for Doctor Anasastaki to come in and tell us what to do with this case. Obviously, you don't wait. Yeah. I know radiographs. We have like three cases like this. I just wanted to show you. So just yes. uh, obviously going through uh, is just a stepwise approach to this type of case. Obviously, this is uh, uh, yes. amelogenesis imperfecta. Uh, I don't know what does that change your treatment plan in terms of if you are going to approach this case. Yes. So what we see here is like one hundred percent. No, I mean that's a lot of attrition right there. So mm -hmm. most probably this patient, you know, is a is a vertical tour. You know, if you have if you have him chew on a gum, he would go like that and that and that. And he applies a lot of force. Um, you can see that. Most probably he's also a Braxer because you can see that from his exostosis. And you're also mentioning about amylogenesis imperfecta. So because of the, you know, force factor and because of the amylogenesis, uh, if I was to restore that patient, first of all, you do need to alter the vertical dimension of occlusion because there's no space when he's biting down. Mm -hmm. I would go with, you know, complete coverage crowns uh, I would not choose only, like I mentioned in the last part. I would go with complete uh, coverage grounds. Um, this patient needs to be worked, you know, one full day appointment, restoring all the upper with provisionals, mm -hmm. and then one day full appointment, restoring all the lower with provisionals. Um, this is how I would work the patient. Um other questions about that? Yes, uh, and, and no, you, no, no, def you definitely yes, you definitely need to provisionalize this patient with full arch provisionals on both arches. Leave him like that for a month. Uh, let him break what he needs to break, so you can make the necessary um, occlusal adjustment. So you, it's very important. So, so uh, you mean that? So prior to prepping the tooth at all. So you say. Uh, is this, so you're you're gonna do a mock up and from the mock up make provisionals? Is that what you're saying? Yes. So in this patient, first of all, you can mo do a mock up, and second of all, because his teeth are so worn down, you can also do something like a snap on smile. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yes. You can, actually, patient yes. actually, yes. Exactly. So like you can just restore with table tabletops, snap on smile, like without even touching his teeth. You can actually alter the vertical dimension and let him work like that. Or you can actually prep and restore with, you know, traditional um, okay, provision. Mm -hmm. Yes, but whatever you do, leave him in provision in a provisional phase for a long time. Let him find his, you know, uh, his, his, his wear, his pattern, sorry. Let him find his functional pattern Mm -hmm. So you can you know, adjust your provisionals accordingly and then proceed with final restorations. Okay. All right. I, I guess, I guess we'll, we'll take, obviously uh, we're looking at this. I know there's some of them that are close. So testing vitality, right. To see if any of them needs, um, um, cause it's kind of worn down to the pulp in some areas. Yes, You can do that, but if he has no, you know, if he's not complaining about the symptom, like, 
that's like I used to think like that, like uh, uh it's so worn down, maybe it, used, it needs endo. But if he's not complaining about uh any symptoms, I will just you know go on and provisionalize. Okay, okay. All right, there's Yes. another one here. Um, how how would you approach it? He's already wearing a a, pro, a, a re removal Yeah. at the back to you know. Yes. So So, the <laughs> um, the question is how I would provisionalize or what Oh, would yes, I do? because I know the, with the crowns on the, on the posterior end, the crowns seem to meet the, uh, the anteriors are worn down, but the crowns, the, posteriorly, they are not. So in terms of how do you... Um... Yes. So that happens because you do have that compensative uh, eruption of the anterior teeth, right? Yes. Like you see how much worn down they are and yet there is no space in between and yet they are meeting each other. Yes, That's because yes. you can see that the gums have like dropped down. That's a compensate, compensation eruption. Um, so that's a really, uh, that's actually a very tough case because, uh, in order to like in the back, I, I suspect that if you remove, I mean, in that vertical dimension that the, that the, um, that the dentures are holding, you do have space in the back to restore as you'd like, but for the front, um, I think. you need to do something surgical. Either it's like crown lengthen these teeth or, you know, um, I think you do, you do need to definitely crown length the the upper ones and then see with a good wax up if you can bring, you know, if you can bring the upper to overlap a little bit the lower. But I do think you do need to crown length uh, upper and lower um, centrals Mm -hmm. from, okay from, you you know, know? I, I guess we'll be calling you later on for for tips <laughs> on dealing with this one this was That's probably... just my ideas, you know. That's whatever comes to my mind right now. I may be totally wrong. But I think all right there's all just, right there's we'll have just one so last much. one to take a look at here right here Yes. All right. Let me just. Uh that's similar to the other one. However, uh, he's okay. Let me see. There's a little bit of an overlap in the anterior, so that gives you. Uh, looks I think that's an e that's an that's an easier case. Yes. Yes, that's an easier case. Uh, yes, again, we do see a lot of this. We do see a lot of these. Like, that's the most difficult case when you do have space and when you don't. You do have such wear in the back, but you have a lot of wear in the anterior. Uh, that's a Turner classification uh, category three. There is a classic article about that. Yes. So, crown length. Crown lens, crown lens, uh, uh, surgically remove a little bit of gums and bone, maybe in the lower and, or, or if the patient is, you know, willing to, or you can all open the vertical dimension, but that means you need to alter like all of the teeth. And Yes. I don't know if the patient, you know, is, uh, you cannot just alter and let, you know, half of the teeth not touching. So if you're going to alter, you need to touch all of the teeth. You need to change the old restorations. It's a huge process. If not, see what you can see what you can gain from you know some surgical uh, removal of gums and bone there. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, that, was, uh, that was fun uh, taking a look at those cases. But I'm going to look at there are some questions here Yes. in the chat section. Uh, I'm going to go ahead here. Any tips? So, Yeah. yeah, so you have the, the first one here. What are the tips on delivering multiple crowns? And how would you be cementing these effectively? Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I still get I still I still get anxiety when I know that I have to deliver a lot of crowns uh, when I know it's a today. Um, so, um, let's say I'm doing a full mouth right, and I've, actually, to be honest with you, I've never delivered. Um, I like to take an impression of of a full arts, but I don't like to cement the full arts, and I'm not doing it. So. Obviously, the patient is going to be in full mouth provisional. So what I will do, um, I will just have the upper six ready, lower six ready, cement these. Okay. Uh, uh, upper front sextant, lower uh, front sextant. 
Uh, I have my provisionals holding my vertical dimension of occlusion. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then, so first step, first step, uh, upper six, lower six, and then you can choose. Do you want to go with you know, right and left upper at the same day to restore all the upper maxillary occlusal plane? You can do that. Or do you want to go upper and lower right side? Lower side, okay. Hold with holding the provisionals are holding the other side. So you choose. I chose. Upper six, lower six, uh, one appointment, and then go uh, right and left uh, upper. So I have a nice okay. uh, upper occlusal plane. So if any changes need to be made, they can be made in the lower teeth. Okay, nice, nice. Good, good question here. Is it, What about um, um, a question here? Okay, yeah, you've, you've answered the question multiple on cementing. Is it how would you, could you please elaborate on provisional fabrication on the day of prep? Yes, um, yes. Um, two methods, right? Uh, you have your workshop ready. Uh, from your workshop, you can all you can already have asked for PMMA meal provisionals. You can actually have the provisionals in your hands before you know placing a bear in your patient. Uh, or you can have cells, uh, clear made matrices or patty matrices that you can make your provisionals by yourself at the end of the appointment. Uh, whichever method you use, you need to have those jigs that I mentioned for you to hold the vertical dimension of occlusion while you're relining your provisionals. Um, so let's say you have PMMA provisionals. Um, you're hollowing out your provisionals, you're placing the jig, the jig to hold your vertical dimension, and then you are relining your provisionals at that position, right? Same with the mat, uh, same with the patty matrix. You're placing the jig in one side and then relining your provisionals uh, using the mat, the matrix. Um, the, Dr. It's, Maski, it's I'm going to I'm going to allow yeah. you to speak if uh, if uh, we answered your question, okay? But just uh, we're, we're not going to move on right now. But I'll let you speak if if that's um, if you need to ask um, uh, more details. So, uh, are there what are the patients maintained after a full in terms of a uh, doctor Nala is asking yeah. about um, night guard splints or Botox? All right, that's a good question. Um, it's very important to stabilize those patients because remember, you just put them in a whole different uh, job position. <laughs> they were used to something else and you just uh, rehabilitated their mouth in centric relation, which is something totally different than they used to work. However, it's a physiologic position and they should be able to function and be normal after a certain time. So night guard from day one. Uh, you are giving your patients a night. Uh, you are giving your patients a night guard once the um, the final restorations are there. Um, don't make it too thick because you've already opened up your their vertical dimension. So you don't want them to you know open a lot more when they're wearing the night guard. Um, but give them a night guard because you don't know how they're going to react, how they're going to parafunction for a while maybe, and um, and after all, even if you're not doing it for, you know, for the muscles and then jaw, just do it for your brand new restorations uh, to protect them. So a night guard, splint. Botox, um, I'm only using Botox for those patients that have, you know, extreme muscle symptoms. I, I wouldn't do it as a protective measure for a full mouth rehabilitation, but that's a great question. Okay. All right. Uh, someone was asking about the um, use of. Uh, I I know I I was just trying to bring up just one minute if I can bring it up. Uh, Doctor Marcus Blast. Do you know? Do you? Do you, do you I I follow Doctor Marcus Blast. Yes, he's a he's a idol. <laughs> I follow Doctor Marcus Blast every day, and yes. uh, I wanted to show what he put up some days ago. Uh, that 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 could be really very helpful for folks. Um, so in, in trying to answer this next question. So Dr. Marcus Blass, uh, you know, great guy, great guy, great guy. I, yes. I I can do anything to live close to Philadelphia so that I can yes. learn from him. He's an amazing, amazing clinician here. He talked about the three-step that is uh, 
uh, yes. pioneered by uh, the queen of o the queen. There's a queen of dentistry somewhere in e Italy. Uh, her name is. Uh, I need to think of a name now. Francesca Bailati. <laughs> That's her. You know, she has the three step where she. I mean, mostly does. You know, uh, you know, minimal, minimal invasive dentistry with composites. So this question by Master by Doctor Malik is saying, when would you use composite? as your definitive restoration after, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. does he ever, do you ever do any of those um, biomimetics or, um, mm. yes. Yeah, uh, that's why I mentioned in the last slide very briefly about the new technologies, about the new ways, uh, like moving away from, uh, from uh, full coverage grounds and, you know, going towards tabletops only and things like that. So in here, three-step classic technique. I think she's doing it from 2008. It's almost 20 years now. Uh, I've read her articles. I've never tried her technique, but I really want to. Uh, I think now that I'm in private practice, I have a little bit more freedom to actually go on and try what I want to try. Uh, and I'm going to do it. Um, even her, um, she's saying that these table tabletops that she does for uh, posterior teeth they are provisionals and at some point she's moving to ceramic onlays mm -hmm. if you read through her articles yes. so she's using it as a temper solution right however uh, again like every day there are new materials emerging uh, materials that you know they have a, a percentage of composite but also a percentage of zirconia in them 3d printed materials if I was to test one of these and, you know, if I was to have a good feedback throughout, let's say, a couple of years, see that they're not wearing out that fast, see that they can actually hold the new vertical dimension that I have fought so much to establish, I have no reason why I wouldn't use that as a, you know, as a fi final material, right? Mm -hmm. Again, I have not done it yet. And maybe um, I would do it, um, I would do, let's say, uh, composite only to a patient that could not afford something else and I would call it a long-term provisional and see how that works you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. leave it there and see how that works and I would be very happy if I see that it works perfectly and why not and at the same time a night guard right again yes, yes. long-term composite provisionals plus a night guard and see how it works. All right. Anyway, for, for yeah. those who, you, who do not know, Dr. Marcus Blast is on Instagram. I'm going to put his link on our, our, on my page so that you can follow him. He's a wonderful, like this question you've just asked, you know, he he's talking about, you know, severely eroded dentition using interim direct composites, you know, so that has been tried out there. You know, do you, have you ever done the injection, the composite injection technique? Have you ever done that? Yes, uh, I've done that um, to build up lower teeth, lower incisors. Um, so hmm, mixed feelings about that. Um, okay. <laughs> yes, mixed feelings about that. Uh, I like composite and I don't like composite. Uh, you know, everything is fun and games, but then you have the interdental spaces. Uh, yes. Sometimes it's very hard to clean, you know, and then it's, it's not so good when you start polishing things or removing excesses and then something goes bad and you lose that perfect incisal edge and then you need to go and rebuild you know the morphology again i have mixed feelings but there there is um there's an indication and it's not for every patient patient selection if mm -hmm. it's my last mm -hmm. hope and it's the the only thing that I can do for my patient, I'm just going to try it again and give my best for a nice result. And I think that you need to practice a lot. Uh, it's a, There is a great learning curve with that, you know? Yes. You need to have all your tools ready and you need to predict beforehand what's, what problems you're going to face, how you're going to separate its tooth, uh, make sure that your you know clear mattresses are going to fit again mm -hmm. and again. Just, it needs a lot of, you know, um, preparation. But I think it's a good technique. I think the more you do anything in dentistry, the more familiar you get, the more you like it, the more you actually yeah. use it. That's with everything in dentistry. And that's it.
You, yes. know, you know, dentistry, like I said, you there's a lot of learning. This is Dr. Uh, Anasasaki, who had just finished a three-year residency, a gruesome residency, telling you that you need to practice more and <laughs> learn more. You better listen to her. <laughs> I need to. I know for sure that I need to. So I'm sharing that with you. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's that's a good one. Anyway, there's a question here about uh, um, what's your, your, your general follow-up protocol after delivery? I know you talk about, uh, you yes. know, Closer guards and, and, and all that. Yes. So um, I would bring the patient in again in a week or so. Um, first of all, you know, doing this full mouth cases leaves you very tired by the end of the appointment. So I would bring the patient in again after a week. Uh, make sure I've cleaned all excess cement everywhere. Use my super floss, my scalers. Uh, very, you know, uh, in moderation, seeing how the gums are healing up. And um um make ask the patient if she's wearing he's wearing their night guard and you know ask about any symptoms and signs from the tmj however again because the final crowns are a, just a copycat of the temporaries i should not have any symptoms so all i'm checking is patient satisfaction and all i'm checking you know is you know uh how the gums are healing to my restorations right anyway and, uh, Yes, yes. That's yes. It. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's that's I mean it's an ongoing thing. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Anasasaki, for giving us your Sunday evening. It's been quite, you know, enlightening, very detailed. Uh, I I you know, I don't have a hat on, but uh, you know, I, you. I dropped my hat right here. Anyway, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening and uh, looking forward thank to doing some more collaborations. Like you said, we were we we're thinking of going to do some implant training in Africa, and I'm um, looking forward to having you on board and uh, hoping we can make that happen soon. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. All right. You take care. Have a, have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been uh, a wonderful, uh, a fantastic day. Uh, I'm going to put my email address just in case if anyone wants. Dr. Not Dr. Uh, Nala, I need to talk to you. I, I need to uh, uh, connect with you and see what we can do uh, in, in the future. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'm putting my email address here just in case you have more questions.